Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for this week's video lecture. Today we're looking at Strayer's Chapter 16, Atlantic Revolutions Global Echoes. This is the first of the four chapters in the Unit 5 section, which he calls the uh, European Moment. Um, and to begin, he looks at the Atlantic Revolutions in a global context. And if we take a truly global view of the century between about 1750 and 1850, certain trends become evident. The first trend we see is that the political and social uprisings of the time shook states and empires from Russia to China and from Persia to West Africa. Importantly, this upheaval, upheaval shows how Europe, the Americas, and Africa were increasingly interconnected in the post-Columbian world. Some historians see this as part of a global crisis and place the Atlantic revolutions in this context, arguing for a thesis of converging revolutions. While the Atlantic revolutions did not occur in a vacuum, there were several aspects of the North American, French, Haitian, and Spanish American revolutions that make them distinct and clearly part of an identifiable phenomenon in the Atlantic Basin. Whereas many conflicts, like the Seven Years' War, involved European powers clashing on several continents throughout the world, the Atlantic revolutions were more regional in nature, springing from local grievances and demands. Another feature of the Atlantic revolutions as a whole can be seen in the fact that many of the revolutionary leaders actively participated in other revolutions, providing advice and encouragement to each other. The intellectual, intellectual impact of the Enlightenment created a transatlantic print culture where ideas were exchanged and debated. Importantly, this culture argued that human affairs and institutions could be improved, rationalized, and perfected. Central to these debates was an emphasis on liberty and equality. Finally, the Atlantic revolutions all shared a strong democratic impulse. However, with the exception of Haiti, all of them promoted the interests of white men of property. Yet even as they excluded some members of society in their pursuit of liberty and equality, they did greatly expand political participation throughout their societies. While the immediate events of the Atlantic revolutions were local political acts and events, their impact was truly global, setting the terms and parameters of political debates well into the 20th century. Specifically, abolitionism, nationalism, and feminism will be examined later in the chapter. More generally, however, the ideas of constitutions, representative governments, and basic human rights would have immense global impact right through today. While it is certainly the case that the Atlantic revolutions had certain features in common, it is also true that because each was rooted in a local or regional situation, there are many differences. Let's examine each of them in more detail, going in chronological order. The first of these revolutions led to the creation of a new nation, the United States of America. As the basic facts are well known from our perspective, let us take a different approach by asking the question, what exactly did it change? There is legitimate debate about how revolutionary the American Revolution really was. While it did establish a democracy with an expanding electorate in the coming decades, in many ways, this was merely the institutionalization of pre-existing social relationships and political patterns. There was no wholesale social transformation. English settlers in the Americas identified with England and English culture, but enjoyed the freedoms of life in a land with no hereditary arist or aristocracy, no single church, and economic opportunities stending, stemming from plentiful land, thanks in large part to the removal of the indigenous population. As such, a sense of freedom was central to their identity. As England initially ruled with a rather light hand, they developed an increased sense and practice of autonomy, even though the idea of separation from England was very uncommon in the mid-century uh, American colonies. Things changed, however, when England, dealing with war debts from its various imperial conflicts, raised taxes and established various tariffs to generate revenue. The Americans were equally incensed by both the new taxes and the notion that they were being unjustly imposed upon by the English government. They saw England as violating their popular sovereignty. Thus, tax resistance and ideas from the Enlightenment fused together in an anti-English revolt. While the revolution did lead to a process where more and more men got the vote, political power remained in the hands of the white male elite. There was no radical transformation of society. 
Consequently, many historians have argued that what was most revolutionary about the American Revolution was that it codified the social, political, and economic developments that had occurred in North America before the Revolution itself. Even so, the Founding Fathers believed their right to revolution chartered a new course for humanity, and many people throughout the world agreed. Moreover, the U.S. Constitution, which put Enlightenment ideas into practice, would serve as an inspiration for would-be revolutionaries, especially those in the Atlantic world. In some ways, the French Revolution can be seen as a consequence of the American Revolution. Since thousands of French soldiers had served in the American War, many of them witnessed the example of republicanism and wanted to reform feudal France along those lines. What's more, since France was home to many Enlightenment thinkers, the example of the U.S. Constitution spurred the imagination of many Frenchmen. But the American Revolution also had a more concrete impact on the French Revolution. The French monarchy's support for the American rebels created a massive war debt, and the royal treasury was facing bankruptcy. To pay off the debt, King Louis XVI called the Estates General to raise taxes, thus providing the political opening for the French to start raising their grievances with not only the tax system, but also the entire socio-political system of the Ancien Régime. Indeed, there was widespread resentment of not just the absolute power of the monarch, but of the social divisions in France. The country was divided into three estates. The first two estates, the clergy and the nobility, enjoyed various social and economic privileges. Despite the fact that the third estate represented about 98% of the population, each of the three estates had the same number of votes in the estates general. Resentment of this institutionalized social inequality had been simmering just below the surface for years. When the Estates General convened in 1789, it finally came to the surface when the Third Estate broke away and formed the National Assembly, which claimed to be the sole authority for making laws that govern the country. In the famous Tennis Court Oath, its members pledged to create a new constitution. Shortly thereafter, the National Assembly drew up a document loosely modeled upon the U.S. Constitution. However, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, or the Doromac, as John Green calls it, was much more sweeping in its scope, declaring that all men are born and remain free and equal in rights. From this point on, the trajectory of the French Revolution diverges greatly from its American predecessor. Rather than sketch a narrative of the various phases of the French Revolution, which John Green does rather well in his Crash Course video, Strayer focuses on the ways in which it differed from the American Revolution. Whereas the American Revolution was essentially political, the French Revolution was not only political, but also social, economic, and cultural in nature. It seemed that every segment of French society had its own grievances. The summer of 1789, for example, saw numerous mob revolts in cities and peasant uprisings in the countryside. Over the next few years, the revolution became increasingly radical, with the beheading of the king and queen in 1793 and the ensuing mass executions run by Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety during the Reign of Terror. Eventually, the revolutionaries turned on themselves, and Robespierre himself was sent to the guillotine. Additionally, the French Revolution was, much more, was a much more complete revolutionary movement than the American example. Despite the violence, the French revolutionaries sought to create an entirely new world based on a rational order of things, as seen in the new calendar and a new, more uniform administrative system for the country. In part because of the idea of starting over, the French revolutionaries dealt more directly with questions of social inequality than their American counterparts. While issues of class, race, and gender were not fully resolved, they were never ignored. Moreover, the French Revolution gave birth to the modern concept of nationalism and citizenship. All of these factors led reformers and revolutionaries throughout the world to point to the French Revolution as inspiration. Despite its lofty intentions, after all its twists and turns, the French Revolution ended with the installation of a dictator. When General Napoleon Bonaparte came to power in 1799, he preserved some elements of the revolution, but did away with others. Essentially, he kept the equality, but got rid of the liberty, especially after he became emperor in 1804. 
Napoleon, a military genius, also spread the influence of the French Revolution as his armies conquered most of Europe. While he ended feudalism, proclaimed religious tolerance, and modernized the administrative system wherever he went, his military occupation ironically served to stir nationalist sentiments against the French throughout Europe. In this map of uh, Europe, you can see the incredible influence that uh, Napoleon has gained. The areas in dark green are part of the French Empire. Uh, light green are allies of his. Dependent states are ones that he had conquered, um, but he's still controlled even though they were technically um, separate uh, states. But, I mean, in effect, you can see his influence is almost all of what we now call Western Europe. While the French Revolution would echo throughout the world, nowhere was it so immediate and loud as in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, now called Haiti. With 8,000 slave plantations producing 40% of the world's sugar and as much as 50% of its coffee, this French colony was arguably the richest in the world. A social hierarchy developed in San Domingue that was unique in the Americas. At the bottom were the over 500,000 African slaves who worked on the plantations. Above them were nearly 30,000 gens de couleur, or people of color, who were either freed slaves or of mixed race. The 40,000 whites were then divided between the rich Grand Blanc and the poor Petit Blanc. Each group interpreted the French Revolution in a different manner, and each group was suspicious of the others. As rumors about the French Revolution spread, a massive slave revolt erupted with 1,000 plantations burned and hundreds of whites killed by vengeful slaves. As France lost control of the colony, the various groups formed armies and militias and fought for years in a series of bloody engagements. Seeking to take advantage of the situation, European powers attempted to invade in order to gain some advantage in their imperial struggles. L'Ouverture was a former slave who united various slave factions, dealt with foreign invaders, and even defeated Napoleon's forces. However, he was taken prisoner and died in a French jail. Dessalines took his place and would eventually become the new nation's first head of state. This was a truly radical revolution, as the slaves emerged victorious and established a republic in which they were the majority of the citizens. Haitian leaders spoke openly of avenging the era of colonial slavery. The revolution served as a symbol of hope for other slaves in the region, but as a serious warning to slave owners in the region. The war, the social divisions, the destruction of the plantations, and the end of significant trade with Europe weakened this new nation. These conditions were exacerbated by the independence debt Haiti was forced to pay to France, a financial burden that lasted over a century. To this day, social, economic, and political stability remain elusive in Haiti. The last episode in the story of Atlantic revolutions was clearly inspired by those that came before. However, the Spanish-American revolutions were not one, but a series of revolutions that culminated in the creation of over a dozen new nations. Yet they were all fueled by the Latin American social hierarchy that had developed in the previous period. Creoles, the native-born elite who normally self-identified as white Spaniards or Portuguese, resented the peninsulares who were sent from Iberia to impose authoritarian rule and collect taxes that would be sent back to the monarchs in Europe. However, they did not form a united force to fight for independence in the 18th century. When Napoleon invaded the Iberian Peninsula, deposing the Spanish king and forcing the Portuguese king to flee to colonial Brazil, he created a political power vacuum that ultimately led, to the colonies, led the colonies to take some sort of political action, though it would be, would be a much slower process in Latin America than it had been elsewhere in the Atlantic world. After seeing what happened in Haiti, the Creole elite, who now held most of the power in Latin America, were very nervous about lower class Indian and slave rebellions. Consequently, it was difficult for any would-be Latin American revolutionaries to unite people enough to build a mass movement. These brilliant military strategists were heavily influenced by the Enlightenment, 
They created a nativist ideology that united the various class and racial groups of free men, now called Americanos, against a common enemy, namely the Spanish and Portuguese. Bolivar even imagined the creation of a superstate, which he called Gran Colombia, a kind of United States of Latin America that would one day dominate the world. But Bolivar's vision did not become reality. While Spanish rule was over in most of the Americas by the mid-1820s, there was no social revolution, and most of the systems of economic exploitation, social inequality, and patriarchy remained intact. With the Creole elites dominating these new nations, there was little in the way of meaningful democracy until the 20th century. In this map of Latin American revolutions, you can see uh, Haiti is the earliest of these. And note that if you look at the dates of all of these, it's, there's a pretty significant delay. It's not until 1811 that the first one happens. Most of them happen sometime in the 1820s. Uh, Brazil does eventually separate from Portugal. Um, it's a similar process to the ones in the Spanish uh, colonies, but not quite the same. Notice, too, that not all of the Caribbean and Central and South America do uh, gain independence. The British, the Dutch, and the French hang on to a piece of northern South America here. And, of course, Jamaica, Cuba, and Puerto Rico uh, continue to be held by their European uh, powers. The impact of the Atlantic revolutions was felt immediately throughout the Western and even Eastern Europe. Sporadic revolts appeared, expressing the ideas of republicanism, greater social equality, and liberation from foreign rule. But the long-term impact of the Atlantic revolutions was much more global in nature. Perhaps most dramatically among these long-term effects is the nearly universal abolition of slavery, a practice that began with the onset of civilization itself by the, by the end of the 19th century. The shockwaves produced by the Atlantic revolutions created conditions for several different forces against slavery to take shape. Enlightenment thinkers, whose ideas inspired the Atlantic revolutions in the first place, became increasingly more critical of the institution of slavery, focusing attention on the slave's lack of liberty and equality. Protestant evangelicals in general, and Quaker activists in particular, began the abolition, abolitionist movement in the U.S. and England out of a pious moral opposition to slavery. They publicized the evils of slavery and published memoirs by former slaves. Industrialization and the new capitalist systems of production increasingly emphasized the use of labor for wages set in a free market, making the unfree labor of slavery in the Americas and serfdom in Russia look backwards and inefficient. The example of Haiti's successful revolution inspired three rebellions in the British West Indies. The violence required to continue the maintenance of plantations shocked the international community, which by now was watching with interest. Thanks to philosophical, moral, economic, and political opposition to slavery, the British led the way in dismantling the institution by abolishing the slave trade in 1807 and emancipating all slaves in their empire in 1834. Latin American countries followed suit in subsequent decades, and Russia emancipated serfs in 1861. But there was significant resistance to abolition in some slave trading and owning societies, none more so than in the southern states of the U.S. Indeed, the United States stands out as the only nation, I repeat only nation, that had to fight a brutal and destructive civil war from 1861 to 1865 to end slavery. Almost without exception, there were no major social, economic, or political changes with emancipation. In the U.S., for example, land was not redistributed after the Civil War. Jim Crow laws and public lynchings were used as a way to keep black sharecroppers in check, and large numbers of indentured service servants were imported from India and China where they worked in slave-like conditions. In Russia, the emancipation of the serfs did see land redistribution, but the impoverished peasants had to pay for the land, ensuring their continued poverty. With the collapse of slave exporting in Africa, the price of slaves dropped, 
and they became more commonly used to produce crops for export. Ironically, Europeans would later use abolition as a justification for their colonization of Africa. In the Islamic world, there was no grassroots opposition to slavery, and it took international pressure to end the practice there, but not until the 20th century. In addition to contributing to the end of an old institution, slavery, the Atlantic revolutions also gave rise to a new one, the idea of a nation. Specifically, the revolutionary idea of popular sovereignty, that political power rests in the hands of the people and not in the hands of kings or emperors, encouraged people to begin asking the question, who exactly were the people assuming political power? Before the 18th century, being occupied by a foreign ruler was not necessarily viewed as a bad thing, since most people self-identified with a village or maybe a religion. By the 19th century, however, nationalism, the idea that humans should be divided into separate nations, each with a distinct culture and independent territory, had spread throughout Europe. This uh, little tidbit here is not in the textbook, but after Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo, Europeans met in Vienna with two aims, to restore internal power to the monarchies and to create a balance of power among those monarchies. However, the Congress underestimated the nationalism created by the example of the French Revolution and resentment of Napoleon, Napoleon's occupation. Indeed, nationalism undermined the balance of power on two fronts. On the one hand, it unified people and fragmented political systems to create new nations, such as Germany and Italy. On the other hand, it also inspired smaller ethnic groups to break away from multi-ethnic empires to create new nations, such as Greece and Serbia. Popular nationalism fueled pre-existing pre ethnic rivalries. Consequently, it pushed many states toward increasingly violent conflict as international disputes were now arguments between nations, entire populations, and not just between kings. The bloody conflict of the First World War was a product of this phenomenon. Nationalism required defining who was a part of a nation and who was outside of a nation. This became a political act as groups might be forced to become part of a new cultural identity seen in the Russian Empire when Finns and Ukrainians were forced to use the Russian language, or excluded and thus made vulnerable, as seen in the anti-Semitic politics of Germany. But nationalism was not limited to Europe. Indeed, by the 20th century, it would become the dominant global ideology. Interestingly, though nationalism had its root, roots in the Americas and Europe, it would eventually be used as an anti-colonial ideology to fight against imperialism in Africa, the Middle East, India, China, and Japan. Uh, in this map of Europe in 1880, you can see the consequences of rising nationalism. Um, note, Italy and Germany have now united to become new nations. Note as well, uh, Serbia and Greece Serbia is here, Greece is here, have broken away from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in the Russian Empire, Poland, uh, Finland is still part of the empire, but becoming increasingly aware that uh, they feel like they're being repressed and they want their own nation. Similarly, uh, the Czechs, who are part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire, um, are starting to get a growing sense of an awareness of their own national identity as well. The third echo of the Atlantic Revolutions represents a new movement against another age-old practice. Indeed, patriarchy is even older than slavery, having its roots in the agricultural revolution before the first civilizations. So how is it that people began to question a fundamental assumption of civilizations everywhere, that women were subordinate to men in the 19th century? The movement we now call feminism has its roots in the Enlightenment. While several Enlightenment thinkers argued against gender equality, the Enlightenment attack on tradition and the promotion of liberty and rationality in social arrangements provided an intellectual space for many to critique patriarchy. Feminism thus stemmed from the same source as the political revolutions and the secular attacks on slavery. <laughs> 
Wollstonecraft's book, Vindication of the Rights of Women, shows the direct inspiration of the French Revolution's attempt to rebuild social arrangements. Her work was one of the early statements of an explicit feminism. The conference at Seneca Falls in 1848 was the first organized expression of a feminist movement. Its statement drew directly from the American Declaration of Independence. The feminist movement was transatlantic from the beginning. In the U.S. and England, women's organizations formed for a variety of social issues, but the campaign to get the right to vote became, came to dominate by the end of the 19th century. Even so, women continued to score many advances beyond suffrage as they entered new professions and expanded their property rights. Even as the feminist movement won political and professional victories, it also succeeded in sparking deep debates about the role of women in society. Yet there was bitter opposition to various women's rights campaigns. However, if the left remained divided about the issues, the right viewed feminism as an almost alien threat to the foundations of civilization itself. For most of the 19th century, the feminist movement was largely limited to Western Europe and the United States. However, various activists and intellectuals began to take on the cause around the world, and in the 20th century, feminism would influence developments throughout Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. I want to thank you for joining me for this week's video lecture. I um, hope you got the information that you need, and I look forward to seeing you in class.